Good afternoon. This has been really an impressive series of talks, absolutely wonderful. And, and also impressive is the team that we're, we're experiencing, this push to talk. And it's impressive for two reasons to me. One is, of course, because it's pushing to create something, push to start, to create something wonderful. And I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about what we're doing to try to fill, feed a, a world which is becoming ever more overpopulated. But one of the other reasons why this push to start really uh, speaks to me, because it speaks about the individuality of people, this idea that everybody can get better than the position they were in previously. And we've heard a lot of revelations today about people coming from different backgrounds and having different starts. So what I want to talk about a little bit at the beginning is my background. So I was kicked out of school at the age of 15. I grew up in a, in a poor part of the city in Dublin in Ireland. And my mother hates when I say we grew up in a poor background, but it's really true. And, and there's nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, Jamil really made this point beautifully earlier on. In fact, poverty can oftentimes be a gift. And so I got kicked out of school and I bummed around for about four years doing a whole series of jobs and we'll hear about one of those later on. And then I always wanted to be a biologist, so I got into college and I got into the University of Glasgow. And that went well for a few years, thank you very much. And that went well for a few years, but then I dropped out of university. And we just heard Chelsea talking about alcohol and problems that people have. And that was one of the problems I had, so I drank too much. And you guys, Penn State, have St. Paddy's Day, and you do that once a, once a year on the weekend. That was pretty much every college day for me for about a year. <laughs> And I did it extremely well. And I also had some mental health problems. And I also got into a lot of problems with the police and crime. And I eventually got back into college. And I'd have to say that, you know, people can and they get over these labels, which is important. But they also have a network. And I'd also take the opportunity to thank my wife, who's here in the audience, because it's really her who got me back into college and got me onto the straight and narrow. So thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> So here I am as a professor in a university, maybe taking a different route to get here than other people. And now I'm going to talk to you about saving the world and getting more food. And one of the, the heroes of the story for me is this guy, Harry Evans. Harry Indiana Jones Evans. And I spent an awful lot of time traveling around the world with this guy. He's a world expert on diseases. And the reason he's called Har Indiana Jones, he's had a whole range of adventures. He's been shot at by um, Nicaraguan uh, uh, um, uh, soldiers. He's been kidnapped by fishermen off the coast of the Galapagos. He's been driven around by the CIA and Colombia has been trying to control the drug traffic using plant diseases. And when I've been traveling with him, he's been telling me a lot about fung uh, uh, diseases, not of plants, but of ants that I study. So I work on this system called zombie ants. And inside this ant is that's biting a leaf, there are hundreds of thousands of fungal cells that are producing chemicals, very similar to LSD, because we actually get LSD from this group of fungi, and they're controlling the behavior of this ant to make it die on a particular place, just so that the fungus can reproduce. Turns out Harry did some work on this back in the 1970s, and that's the reason I went to speak with him and travel around the world. But his main job is as an expert on uh, so we'd work in rainforests around the world together, but his main job is an e as an expert on plant diseases. And here's Harry taking a picture of Phytophthora, which is crushing the chocolate industry in West Africa. This is a nasty disease. It's named after the Norse god, Thor, because it literally gets into the plant and pummels those plants and, and reduces the ability of people to grow. Cocoa, the tree from which we get chocolate, evolved in South America. And it was then introduced into West Africa in the 1910s. And since then, West Africa has been the major source of chocolate. 80% of chocolate comes from that region. In addition to Phytophthora, there's another disease called swollen shoot virus, which gets in, and this is much more insidious. And I sort of liken this to the HIV of chocolate. It's not nasty in its, in its rainforest trees, but when it gets into cocoa, it debilitates the trees very slowly. And both of these diseases together hamper the ability of people to grow enough, enough chocolate. And the reason people are growing chocolate in West Africa is not because they eat it. They don't eat it at all. They grow it because you guys eat it. Because in West Africa, li money literally grows on trees. It's a cash crop for them. 
but it's a very meager existence. So this farm I visited, you can see the cocoa beans drying out in the back, and in the front you can see the cassava chip. This is what people are eating, and the cocoa is something that they sell. And as much as 60 or 70 percent, and sometimes 100 percent of the crop each year is destroyed by these two diseases working together. And one of the problems that these farms have is it's not just one farmer. So in this house, there's six people living, a mother, a father, and a couple of four kids. And then there's, on the tree, there's an ant colony. Remember, I study ants. There's a million ants inside this nest. And those guys are working 24 hours a day. What they're doing is traveling to the cocoa tree. And they're siphoning off all the, the, the good stuff that would normally go into producing more and better healthy beans. And they're using these insect partners, which are called mealybugs. Normally, they would live in the rainforest, but we chopped that down and we planted cocoa farms. And the mealybugs are jumping onto the cocoa plant and injecting this virus. And this is the virus which is debilitating the crop. But then the ants go a little bit further, and they like to just build this little tent over the mealybugs to protect them, and they use soil. And inside the soil are the spores of this nasty organism, Phytophthora, that I mentioned. So what's a farmer to do? How is she going to increase the yield? And she'd really like to increase the yield because she'd like to send her kids to school. I like sending my kids to school, but she can't. And the reason she can't is she needs them to oftentimes to work on the farm. And so if she had a little bit more cash flow, that's exactly what she'd do. So one of the ideas I think we can do is we can teach her how to recognize the ant trails which are debilitating her plants. Stop her seeing her farm and allow her to see those trails. And a very simple solution, nothing more complicated than soapy water. Can, you can spray persistently onto these trails and you'll stop the trafficking of ants onto this, you'll stop the disease cycle. But frankly, I'm not here to save the chocolate industry. You guys will pay more for your chocolate eventually. It's gone up 42% in the last 18 months, and it will go up even more. I'd like to see farmers having more resources, more money to spend, ability to send their kids to school. What I'm really focused on is staples, like cassava. And one of the reasons I'm focused on staples is because these are the food that people eat every day. So as an Irish person, it's kind of seared into your memory, this idea of the Irish potato famine 170 years ago. And when I was kicked out of school, one of the things I did was work on a farm in the west of Ireland, taking horses up into the field, Connemara ponies, and taking tourists. And what I often tell them stories of these fields. And what you can see in these parallel lines running up are the lazy beds. We, the Irish farmers used to heap up mounds of soil in which they would grow potatoes. The soil was so poor, they had to heap it up, put in some seaweed, try to increase the nutritional content. It was an unusual way to grow it. And we grew a lot of potatoes. And nine million people survived on this. Up until the point, Phytophthora infestans, the same organism we talked about in West Africa, the infectious destroyer of plants, as it's known. It came along and completely obliterated the crop, literally overnight. 1.2 million people starved a slow, miserable debt. That's twice as many people as died in the Civil War here in the US. And then many, many more millions emigrated. So that's not nice. And you would think that maybe we've learned our lesson in the 170 years since. People, people in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa live on staples. It's not potatoes, it's cassava. Still something they pull out of the ground. This guy pulls them out of the ground, and it should be enormous, enough to feed a large family, but it's not. A virus has gotten in and debilitated the crop. But there's lots of people like Harry, you say, experts who've traveled over the world who know all of this, and surely what we're doing is training more of those, investing in more of those, but we're not, as an academy, as a scientist, what we're not doing is training people like him. Surely we should invest in hundreds of PhD students who would follow this guy around the world and learn from him in an apprentice model. But we don't. What we scientists are really motivated to do is get high-impact papers in places like Nature, Science and Cell, bring in large grants to the university. We're not doing this fundamental stuff, neither here in the US nor in England or anywhere else on the planet. So how are we going to move forward? What are we going to do about this? So I was thinking, maybe we could put Harry in a phone. Because all these farmers all over the world, they have really good phones, and gonna, phones are going to get better. And these are smartphones that we've heard about a number of times throughout the talk. You know, what was it, a million times the power of the, 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 the processors that send man to the moon? And they're going to get better and better and better, as we heard about today. 
So let me introduce the next character in this story. This is Marcel Salate, who's at Penn State. Marcel is an incredibly unique and interesting and somewhat uh, a crazy scientist who thinks differently about things. And I went to him and said, Marcel, could we use the phone to fundamentally transform the way agriculture is done? And he said, sure, of course we could. And he works on the web and thinks about these things. And so that's what we did. We had no idea really what we were doing. But in the last two years, we created something called plantvillage.com. And we have people who really help, like Lindsay McNamany, who's a Scottish plant biologist. And she's, I sort of think of her as the Robin Hood of plant diseases. She goes into university libraries like Penn State and literally robs from the rich and gives to the poor. And in this phone, you can literally get thousands of pages of information, high quality scientific information for free and thousands of images. And then there's people like Brian who help in designing a really beautiful site which is optimized for mobile um, technology, which is particularly important in sub-Saharan Africa. So how have we done making this free library available for people around the world? Well, we've done really well. In the first two years, we've had almost a million visitors, and it's just rapidly increasing. In the next couple of years, we're going to go to tens of millions, and really, it's billions of people on this planet every day are growing food. And these are the people we want to reach. And not just poor farmers in Africa or India, but people here in the US, people who feel they've been divorced from the, from, from the food production industry. In the US today, less than 1% of, of the people are farmers. There are more people in prison in the US than there are practicing as farmers. But lots of you want to grow. Lots of you want to be engaged. And so we have hundreds of thousands of people coming from the US, community-supported agriculture, for example. So that's our idea, fundamentally transform the way that people access knowledge. But I mentioned about putting Harry in the phone. And we're going to go further. Now that we built this largest publicly available free library in the world and the largest social network, we're going to go much, much further. We're not going to stop. We're actually trying to train the phone to recognize what the diseases are. We're trying to use computer vision and machine learning algorithms with people here at Penn State who can understand these things. And then eventually, just the whole crowd, people who are going to crowdsource this ability to ideally recognize diseases in real time for farmers. And that's a bit of a difficult thing. You would think, you know, at this stage and in this, in this moment in time, the world will be free of free and open access images. In order to train a computer to recognize a problem, you need to have lots of images that the computer can be trained with. Facebook does a really wonderful job because you all give your images for free to Facebook. So when it created an algorithm called DeepFace, it trained that algorithm on 4 million images from 4,000 users, which is why when you point your phone at somebody, it immediately recognizes what a face is. So we humans need crops, but no one ever thought, well, isn't it a good idea just to put all of this stuff on the web, free and open access? So it's, you know, that's one of our major challenges. So we use Penn State students to overcome that. This is Kelsey, and you can tell she's a Penn State student because she's wearing a ton top. And one of her jobs is to take thousands and thousands of images of tomatoes. We're going to start with a tomato. We're going to train the computer to recognize all of these diseases. And so we can then have an automate to take the human out of it. I would love if the, if the, if the government decided it was a great idea to tra train thousands of Harry Evanses. It's never going to happen. We're not moving in that direction. So let's use technology, let's use the crowd, and let's use this ability to create knowledge and share knowledge so we can actually feed the 9 billion people who are going to come to the dinner table in the next 20 years or so. So I mentioned this cast of characters, people like uh, Harry, Marcel, Lindsay, Brian, Kelsey, and then others that I haven't mentioned, like Xavier and Colin and, and uh, Rebecca, people who are working on campus helping us find this. None of them, except for Lindsay, have a background in plant diseases. We're all an unusual cast of characters who've come together and have tried to think about ways in which we can solve this problem. And believe me, it truly is a problem. And so this really leads me to think about what you can do and obviously join the gang and help out and sign up for Plant Village and share it with everybody you can think of and maybe the TED talk will also be really helpful in that regards. But think of any problem you can. And we heard about the, the, the reading this morning, a really impressive, wonderful way to get books into the hands of kids. Think about any problem you can and think about ways in which you can change it. Because that's really the theme of today, ways in which you can get past the position you are in now to go out and change the world. So please do that. Thank you.